Let's get started with the panel. We have a very weighty, important, complex topic and only now about an hour and seven minutes to cover it in with some excellent speakers. So I'd ask everyone maybe to take your seat and we can, we can start. Uh, this is the panel, Cross-Border Data Flows, Where Do We Stand? Uh, I'm Christopher Kuhner. I'm co-director of the Brussels Privacy Hub at the VUB Brussels. And you will notice from the program I was to be the chair but not the moderator. However, uh, our planned moderator, Malavika Javaram, from the Berkman Center in Harvard, unfortunately could not be here and sends very, her, her apologies to everyone. So I've now been asked on a short notice to step in and fill this role. Uh, the focus of this panel is transborder data flows or cross-border data flows at the global level. Uh, we've just heard a very interesting panel in this room on the EU-US discussion. That's certainly a very important discussion and a very interesting one. Uh, but we want to make this panel not just focus on that and talk about this topic in a more global level. And in particular, to focus perhaps on the four questions which we've listed in the program. Uh, what does it mean in, a, in an age of the internet and ubiquitous computing even to regulate or, or, or to talk about cross-border data flows? What does this mean? Uh, what are the different regulatory approaches that are being used around the world? What are their, their pros and cons? Uh, what prospects could there be for an international solution in this area? And then how can we avoid, how can we regulate this area in a way that avoids as much as possible international conflicts? Uh, we have four excellent speakers here on the panel. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading all of their CVs because that would, that would take quite a while and they're all very well known figures. Uh, to my far right here is Colin Bennett. Uh, professor at the University of Victoria in Canada, British, uh, British Columbia, Canada, a very well-known, long-standing, influential author and, and uh, figure in the privacy world. Uh, over here is Professor Danilo Doneda, uh, Professor of Civil Law at the State University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, he, I think you also work at the Consumer Protection Office at the Brazilian Ministry of Justice. So you can give us a very valuable South American perspective. To my right, uh, standing in for uh, Bruno Gencarelli is Mr. Thomas Tsadik, who's the deputy head of unit in uh, DG Justice uh, at the European, uh, the, the European Community, which of course has the responsibility for data protection and the data protection reform, which has been proposed and still ongoing. And then to my far left is Mr. Hosok Lee Makiyama, uh, who is currently director of the European Center for International Political Economy here in Brussels. Uh, however, you've also worked, you, you have a very varied background, a lot of work in international uh, bodies like the WTO, WIPO, et cetera. And I think you're also a columnist in an important Chinese business newspaper. So, we have very, a very, very experienced panel to discuss this important issue. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of our speakers to limit themselves to 12 minutes. I will try to be strict with that while, while retaining a rule of reason. Uh, we will then try to leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, and perhaps I might give a, qu a quick summing up. Our first speaker will be Professor Bennett, Colin, I will give you the floor. So, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, thank you to all the organizers, organizers of CPDP. I'm delighted to be here again. Um, in my view, uh, the longer I go on in this area, I've reached the conclusion that everything that you actually need to know about politics or international politics um, is included in the BBC uh, satirical program, Yes Minister. And one of my favorite <clears throat> episodes is called The Compassionate Society. And this story revolves around a hospital in North London that has 500 administrative staff, but no medical personnel and no patients. And when Sir Humphrey Appleby, the permanent secretary, is confronted by Minister Jim Hacker, 
about this strange state of affairs. He defends the situation by listing all of the essential functions that this a hospital, that the administrative staff are in fact performing. Um, data and research, finance, ancillary staff, cleaning and catering, contingency planning and so on. It's one of the best run hospitals in the country, he asserts. But there are no patients, Humphrey, Minister Jim Hacker says. That's what hospitals are for. Patients, ill people, sick people, healing the sick. Uh, but first of all, Minister Humphrey replies, you have to sort out the smooth running of the hospital. Having patients around would be no help at all. They would only get in the way. And I have a similar reaction when I contemplate the 40-year debate on how to regulate the international transfers of personal data. We have guidelines, reports, binding corporate rules, cross-border privacy rules, analysis of legal frameworks. We have comparisons of tr transparency, consent, notification, security, access and correction. We have lengthy debates about the relative merits of country to country versus organization to organization models. We have rules upon rules, standards upon standards, model clauses. We have accountability mechanisms, complex models to ensure the interoperability of accountability mechanisms. We we now have many international regimes that are involved in this debate. There is now a plethora of domestic and international instruments, all of which comprise the international governance of privacy, but with few exceptions, at least in cross-national contexts, there are actually few data subjects. No individuals actually participating in this process. It's few complaints by real people in real cases for the cross-national assertion enforcement of privacy rights. Brand new edifices of data protection and nobody actually using them. Data protection without data subjects, hospitals without patients. Now I'm overstating the case a little bit, I admit, uh, but I've looked at this area for the last 40 years and I've looked at the overall development of international re regulation and really, you know, over the last 40 years, and you go back to the 1960s and uh, reports of the OECD in the light, late 1960s which talked about what was then called trans-border data flow, um, you know, it's, 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 it, you, you, you don't find many cases where individual data subjects have in fact successfully pursued their privacy rights uh, against organizations that reside in different jurisdictions. Certainly those rights exist in the abstract, they exist hypothetically, they exist in every set of principles you look at, OECD, EU, APEC, Council of Europe and so on. Um, and while they exist, although used extensively and variably under domestic data protection laws against domestic organizations, it's actually rare to find the assertion of those rights being uh, successfully uh, asserted uh, to organizations that reside offshore. Notwithstanding the recent flood of takedown requests to Google under the right to be forgotten ruling, and notwithstanding, I think, also the increasing cooperation under between DPAs under the Global Privacy Enforcement Network. So in, in the last two or three minutes, I want to suggest some hypotheses about why this state of affairs might occur. Um, in the Governance of Privacy, which Charles Rabb and I wrote, um, now published in 2006, uh, we made a distinction between privacy principles that confer obligations on an organization and those that grant, grant rights to the data subject. And I think considerable progress has been reached in ensuring the former in cross-border context, but very little has been made on the latter, I would assert. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. I mean, I think first of all, you, you know, I, I, would, I would say four hypotheses, right? One is you could conclude that there's a sort of redundancy hypothesis. If the laws are solid, if the corporate compliance is there, then, you know, you could argue that individual participation is actually not that necessary. And that seems to be a lot of the assumption behind the discourse of the word protection or the discourse of the word safe harbor. Um, the, the individual is there but is ancillary to the process. If the law is adequate, then the individual is protected. If the corporate compliance is there, then the individual is protected. An associated reason has got to do with globalization. We talked about this on the last panel. Um, and several years ago, and I think the rules in the directive and other rules, uh, including safe harbor, as Eduardo was mentioning, were based on the assumption of bilateral transfers between controllers and controllers. We now live in a different world, and this is a, this is a cliche. Um, uh, global, multi-directional, requiring commensurate responses. The transfers are far more complex. 
and it's, it's therefore far more absurd to try and regulate uh, geographically uh, transfers across borders. And in that environment, I think, it's impossible for any individual to track the source or risk of, of the harm and, and the organization that's responsible. Uh, there's a third reason, I think, which is, which is a bit more positive, and that is that over the years, the surrogates, those people who represent data subjects, the gatekeepers, um, I think have, have, have become more assertive. We now have far more advocacy groups that can increasingly be assertive and act on individuals' behalf. Um, unlike the 1970s and the 1980s when data protection law emerged, there is now a network of privacy advocates and activists, which I documented in the book I wrote called The Privacy Advocates, who can step in. And there's some very important examples. Europe v. Facebook, SIPIC uh, in Canada, uh, EPIC's cases against Google and Facebook and so on and so forth. And increasingly, of course, DPAs act. And, and do so uh, against international companies without necessary intervention by data subjects. So, so I think that has also changed. But then, you know, the, the, finally, you know, there is a sort of conspiracy hypothesis here, and this has to be said, that um, these rules were never actually intended to help data subjects, but to help business. Um, the instruments, therefore, legitimate surveillance, legitimate the capture and the processing of data, and encourage free flow. And they're replete with so many complex and obscure exemptions that most individuals would, would give up trying to assert their rights in a cross-national context. And um, if, if you look at, at some of the critiques of the APEC system, the CBPR system, there's a lot of that sort of assumption behind that. Now, now I'm an academic, and I see truth in all over the place, um, uh, in different arguments, and so I think each of those ideas has some validity. Um, but I do want to make it clear that I'm not just critical of the self-regulatory or co-regulatory mechanisms of BCRs and CPBRs. I, I think that, that the adequacy regime of the last uh, 25 years or so has also uh, administered through the EU has also not been fit for purpose. And I think that the uh, lengthy and bureaucratic legalistic analysis of the black letter of, of foreign data protection law within the depths of um, uh, Brussels is, uh, is somewhat removed and abstract. Um, although I note with interest that the Commissioner said that the, that, um, the, the judgments about adequacy uh, are going to be sped up and under the regulation, hopefully. And I also note that they've said that Canada and other countries that have already been judged adequate will maintain that adequacy judgment. Um, so I, I think in conclusion what I would like to, to, to offer you here is, uh, is a couple of, of really profound paradoxes in this whole area. Um, and, and which, I, I, which I don't really see as, as um, um, uh, easy um, to, to resolve under any of the models that I look at. Um, I think on the one hand, you've got the, the problem that the country to country model uh, represented by the adequacy framework is plagued by the false assumption that an assessment of a law does in fact guarantee compliance and it does not. You can have unaccountable organizations in adequate countries. The organization to organization model, the outcountability approach, uh, and Canada's law PIPITA is often cited as the main and the principal and the first legal framework that uh, represented that particular approach, it, it, it is, is, it, uh, is plagued by the dilemma, I think, that you can have accountable organizations in inadequate jurisdictions. And as much as companies might, uh, might uh, 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 as many efforts that they might make in order to ensure good privacy management and corporate compliance, that cannot compensate for the weakness of legal enforcement and the redress mechanisms that we see in many parts of the world. Um, and I think to some extent that sort of problem is exacerbated by the fact that the debates we have about international data flow and how to regulate it, as it, I, it tends to be within the context of US versus Europe, as we saw on the last panel. Now, those are obviously very, very important debates, but the context and the way that discourse is framed, free flow versus privacy, freedom of information versus data protection, etc., I think tends to obscure the, the, the global problems that are at stake here and also other countries. Um, it's easy to say that we need adequate laws and accountable organizations, um, but I've never seen regulation, self-regulation as alternatives, but as a package of policy instruments, all of which are necessary and none of which are su sufficient. Those instruments reside as a continuum. Uh, 
And that, too, is the assessment that Charles and I made in the governance of privacy, and I think it's still quite valid. A second point I'd make, and a second sort of paradox, I think, is that the larger the framework, the bigger the framework, the more global the framework, the more you put privacy into trade rules, the more it's, it, it's embraced by or thought about in the context of larger international economic issues. The, f the more removed the, the real consumer, the real data subject is. Real people who have real problems concerning uh, their reputations and their privacy in the context of the transfer of international data. And I see that, therefore, as, as another paradox, which I think you know, um, we really need to think about clearly when we have these global debates about the, 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 the um, the benefits and the costs of country to country, organization to organization, regulation versus self-regulation versus co-regulation. So to conclude, Chris, and coming back to Yes Minister, um, at another part in the episode that I um, cited earlier, Minister Hacker uh, is actually visiting this hospital, and the administrator of the hospital boasts and is very proud of all the fancy, shiny operating equipment in the hospital. Doesn't it appall you that it's not being used, asked the minister. Oh no, very good thing, in a way, comes the response. It prolongs its life and cuts down the running costs. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Colin, for those really brilliantly provocative remarks, which indeed set the stage very well. You've also been perfectly on time, right to the minute, which is a moderator always appreciates uh, quite a bit. I'm going to turn now to Professor Doneda uh, to ask for your remarks, please. Thanks, Christopher. Much of uh, international data transfer rules we can find today in European and also other legislations were crafted in a time when global data sharing was noticeable less intense than today, and concepts such as cloud computing basically didn't exist. At the same time, personal data has become more and more an essential component of international commerce. As some com commercial associations say and advise, no data, no trade. In the body of these international data transfer rules, we can identify some of, of the most rigid and, in a certain way, traditional set of rules that can be found in the field of data protection. Hardly in another form of data treatment, there is such a combination of tools as the prior approval from a public body as a condition to treatment, or the mandatory inclusion of a strict set of contract clauses, the adequacy, and so on. Also, as in few other occasions, bureaucracy has a potential to be such a hassle. The symptoms of rigidity in the general framework of international data transfer rules have their roots, almost archetypal roots, in the fear that data protection laws risk to become irrelevant if foreign countries with no data protection framework enacted or with faulty ones attracted data treatment services based on, on the seduction of low costs in an unregulated jurisdictions. Not much remains today from this original fear, as today there are not as many countries that can count as unregulated jurisdictions when it comes to data protection and even if it's the case, it generally happens that they are not a, as good an option for transferring data treatment operations due to several other factors. And add this to the accountability that enterprises earn to own directly to their customers or consumers when it comes to abusing their personal data. Interestingly, international data transfer rules have a very important side effect. It is much plausible that the, the existence and rigidity of international data transfer rules have contributed to turn the landscape of data protection regulation in a more coherent and interchangeable one. That happens because international data transfer rules, such as the European ones, have its indirect but essential role as a factor of dissemination of standards. Using an expression taken from the works of Professor Colin Bennett and Charles Rabb, the phenomenon of the convergence between different data protection regulations have its roots in the incentives many countries feel to share standards in data protection law. And in the sense, European Union experience is the most rich and intense. Uh, in a similar way, the Italian professor Stefano Rodata noticed it long ago that the spread of similar standards in data protections data protection laws 
even without treaties or any central coordination, was a very interesting ca case of gl globalization through human rights, that is, of the law acting as an inductor for social change that improved globalization and law harmonization. To illustrate this statement, we can take a quick look at how data protection laws first spread into Latin America. The first general data protection law in the region was enacted in, in the year 2000 in Argentina. Argentina was in the middle of a major economic crisis, which led it to look for, to look for innovative means to make its own economy more competitive and attract capital. What happened, in fact, when three years later, the country received the, the, the adequacy from the European Commission. Argentina had its own data protection framework, so recognized as adequate, and the pursuit of the adequacy played also a relevant role in the approval of Uruguay data protection law in 2008. Uh, Uruguay is also an adequate country by uh, the, 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 the standards of Euro European Commission, and even Colombia, which where the outsourcing of Spanish call centers were on, was one of the fake factors that drove the country into the enactment of a general data protection law in 2012. Regardless of a rational need for standardization and a harmonic set of rules for international data transfer, the scenario today doesn't seem to be moving fast into the direction of any kind of treaty or international document or a huge coordinated effort towards it. Partly, it is due to factors as the difficulty in finding a recognized international leadership without having that don't have the record of big unsolved disputes. Take, for instance, the tension between US and Europe regarding passenger name records. And partly, it is also because uh, the models of international data transfers are facing the imminence of being reformed, changed together with the reform in the EU, European use, Union legislation. For now, considering these situations and considering that good efforts towards international harmonization in this field, for instance, the Madrid Declaration of 2010, are not yet ready as a basis for actual international standardization, it remains that the framework for international data transfers can be gathered only by the consolidation of the several national and regional standards, which is in fact a puzzle. In what concerns should the consideration of regulatory approaches, I'll profit my time to focus in my country, Brazil. Brazil don't have, as of yet, a data protection law and act, and so international data transfers are basically an unregulated matter in my country. In fact, the issue was discussed many years ago in the 70s, when Brazil took part in the uh, United Nations Agency, the Intergovernmental Bureau for Informatics, but that the, uh, the year was having gone anywhere, uh, uh, computer law of 1984 also tried to do something in the sense, but no regulation was enacted by the time. And today you have the, the, the scenario when Brazil legal framework of, in data protection is basically a sectorial one dealing with financial data, right of access, and other questions, none of them approaching the problems of international data transfers. However, it does not mean at all that issues regarding the international flow of personal data haven't affected the country. In a study prepared by McKinsey and Company, Brazil is appointed to be losing tens of billions of in foreign investments by not assuring a regulatory framework to protect personal data. <laughs> also, since 2013, the glossary of data protection in Brazil was incremented with a single word, sovereignty. After the Snowden revelations that had a great impact in the field of privacy in the country, uh, this, the revelation called the attention to several effects of the misuse of personal data. The, this issue, generally, per, uh, protection of personal data, which was generally regarded as a lesser priority than others in the governmental agenda, was then lifted to the class of the urgent ones. It also happened that concerns about digital privacy, general, generally confined to a rather small part of the population, reached to the public debate. The way the issue was conducted in the internal front 
uh, however, have not driven to the discussion of international standards for data transfers. In fact, it, the, the problems were not even treated as a problem that have to do with data protection, but rather with the concept of digital sovereignty. The issue, the interception of communications, was viewed mostly from the point of view of the, of the potential loss of sovereignty it could cause than a problem that regarded individual freedoms and civil rights. In the sense, the very fact that Brazil, Germany, and other countries proposed and had approved a, a new United Nations declaration called Right to Privacy in Digital Age did not have a direct impact on the formulation of public poli policies, towards standards, rules regarding international transfers in Brazil. In fact, the approach taken to conduct the question was basically profit a legislation which was being prepared, the Internet Civil Rights Framework, which is called also the, in Portuguese Marco Civil on Internet, to introduce in it instruments that could, in theory, protect the, the internet traffic in the country from being surveilled by foreign actors. To try to achieve this goal, two propositions were made. One regarding the mandatory localization of databases, and another proposition regarding the ru internal routing of the communications in the internet, tow internally towards Brazil. The second proposition was not supported for long because of technical reasons. However, due uh, the localization proposals remain uh, supported by the government since uh, two of the last versions of the Marcos Civil having been finally withdrawn in the last drafts. Marcos Civil Internet, the, 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 the law which is regarded as, for some as the constitution of Internet Brazil, however, which is not a data protection law, but however, it uh, contains a jurisdiction clause which is very important in the matter of international data transfers. In the Article 11, we can read that. In any operations of collection, storage, retention, and treatment of personal data by connection providers and, and internet applications, where at last one of these acts takes place in the national territory, the Brazilian law must be mandatorily respected including in regard to the rights of privacy and the protection of personal data. That purely jurisdictional approach has its several limits, as is shown by analogy. In consumer law in Brazil, we have a similar approach, which is a, 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 any commercial a consumer transaction would have one of the, the acts uh, that took place in Brazil can be uh, regulated by consumer law. But in fact, international commerce is not regulated, uh, consumer internet commerce is hardly regulated effectively by consumer law because of the financial and uh, even logistical difficulties towards this. In conclusion, the lack of prior experience in Brazil with the regulation of trans-border data flows and the imminent failure of solution proposed to approach this issue makes it hard possible to envisage how it be addressed in the future, at least with the, 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 the actual uh, regulation in place. But one possible and feasible opportunity to advance the discussion in my country will be uh, when an imminent data protection bill, which is being prepared by the federal government for some years, will be publicly disclosed and uh, possibly a uh, central congress then it will be necessary to measure the need for innovation and protection of civil rights in a developed country with, uh, with the actual instruments available to regulate data flows. The option Brazil check can be very important to establish and notice if there is a trend in America and even global that could influence other legislations. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. We're all here in, in, in Europe, and I know all over the world, very, very interested in developments in Latin America, and particularly in Brazil with regard to data protection and privacy. So it was, it was great to hear that, uh, that overview from first hand. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Thomas Sertik from the European Commission, one of the people who's been most deeply involved uh, in, in the entire uh, formulation of the data protection reform and, and then following it through the, the, the process. So Thomas, we're very interested to hear what you will say. Okay, well, thanks, thanks Chris, and uh, thanks to the organizers for um, letting me share some of my views on, on the issues also mentioned by Colin and uh, Danilo and uh, later on by Hosuk. Um, 
I'd like to talk about data protection legislation, um, give you something on convergence, we've heard this already, um, also on where I see international treaties can play a useful role, and also on conflicts, because ultimately um, we have conflicts on data protection and privacy. Um, data protection rules, and specifically legally binding data protection rules, I believe are more necessary today than ever. And um, why is this? Obviously, information is everywhere, um, personal data is everywhere, um, transfers are more complex, I agree with uh, Colin, um, but we have those developments, you know, Internet of Things, big data, cloud, all these transnational um, things which are going on, which make personal data available to a multitude of people. So we need data protection rules for that, and that's not something a regulator is saying because otherwise we would go out of business. Um, this is because business are approaching us and demand legal certainty. Business come and say, we need the rules. We need to know what's going to happen in that and that case. So please let us have the rules. Um, but it's not only business. It's, um, as Colin was trying to uh, say, we do have data subjects and um, individuals, the people whose personal data are being processed, they ask for more protection. They ask for a legal framework um, which lets them work, live, without any fear that their personal data is being misused, abused, or processed unlawfully. And um, speaking of which, um, Colin, please, I'm not an academic. I come from a, a practical experience. Individuals do complain, as is their right. Um, come and talk to the um, national regulators, the national supervisory authorities who are being flooded with complaints, requests, um, people showing, expressing their concerns. Um, come to our unit in the European Commission. Uh, we have an uh, increase of 200% last year of uh, people who complain to us about perceived or uh, uh, real data protection issues. And within the European Union, we see more and more transnational cases being picked up. I mean, you see the Austrian student Max Schrems complaining about something which is happening in Ireland. Um, and all of these issues are and triggers for the European data protection reform because we need to have a coherent interpretation of the law, a coherent answer on specific situations in the European Union. So we're actually making rules, real rules for real people. So um, I'd be happy to show you some data subjects who complain heftily. But it's not about individuals. Uh, I think that's important to underline. Data protection, privacy, is not only a value for me or you or everyone here in the room as an individual. This is a value for society as a whole. Um, society needs privacy. Um, this underpins democracy. And this is where um, I think all member states of the European Union agree. If you look at their constitutions, data protection privacy is in the Constitution. It's in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights as a value for society, without which we couldn't work and function. And this is where I don't see a contradiction with the issue of sovereignty. After all, what is a state? A state is the representation of interests of the people. So a value for the people um, that requires sovereignty uh, issues. On convergence, I fu fully agree. Um, we certainly see more convergence than divergence in data protection rules and privacy um, legislation. Um, Danilo mentioned it, Colin uh, is on that uh, uh, as well. More and more countries outside the European Union adapt horizontal omnibus legislation on data protection and privacy. Um, South Africa, we've heard about Latin America, Asian countries. More and more countries realize the importance of independent data protection supervisory authorities as a, as a, um, a pillar for the effective enforcement of these rules. 
and we see a great network of data protection supervisory authorities globally developing where they exchange best practices and uh, ensure the information flow about national legislation. So we see other models which are mostly those models with a sectoral approach more and more isolated. Don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with a sectoral legislation on data protection, but it should be coherent and consistent and be based on a general set of rules. Um, so even in the United States, we see at federal level, at state level, a push for more data protection legislation. So that's good news. At the same time, in Europe, at the Council of Europe, um, we see um, the Council of Europe rules upon which, as you know, the European Union rules are based. They're modernizing the Convention on Data Protection and that attracts an interest of more and more non-European countries. Again, a sign of convergence, uh, global interest in data protection rules and we've heard about the, um, the, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution sponsored by Brazil and Germany, which is a resolution for the right to privacy, expressing a global sentiment and conviction that this is a human right, it's a fundamental right, and it should be acknowledged and effectively implemented everywhere. Which brings me to the topic of international treaties. They do play an, they pl play an important role, and uh, certainly the EU is making use of that wherever we can. Um, as an example, um, we are negotiating the uh, so-called umbrella treaty with the United States, as you know, which is an international treaty which should lay down general principles for data protection and privacy protection in the area of law enforcement and police um, uh, inf information. So to enable a lawful police information exchange between the US and the European Union based on the protection of personal data. But obviously that approach doesn't work everywhere and um, certainly other ways are possible and we've been hearing about some of those. Um, I just mentioned, for example, the binding corporate rules and the APEC, uh, cross-border privacy rules, where um, we see a certain amount of commonalities, which is welcome, and the Commission certainly is, is happy to, to guide companies to, to explore those commonalities and to um, identify and uh, certify both frameworks if that's possible, because that is a flexible approach to guarantee data protection in cross-border exchanges. This is also where, and as Chris rightly pointed out, uh, where the EU data protection reform comes in, which has a chapter which um, underpins the importance we attribute to data transfers, um, which puts black and white on paper uh, new tools for such transfers. For example, the binding corporate rules, BCRs, they are now put on paper for the first time at EU level in legislation, um, which uh, is uh, hopefully um, achieving the benefits um, we've seen so far with the current approach on BCRs. There is room for memorandum of understanding subject to certain um, limitations and conditions. And yes, uh, Colin has mentioned it, the adequacy findings are here to stay, but uh, let me uh, say in an improved version, uh, so we will see more of this, um, which should be easier, as we say, in, in a converging world. My last take is on conflicts. Um, we see convergence, but um, there will be also more conflicts because more personal data will be exchanged um, and more people will complain. Our answer as the European Commission is um, conflicts should be resolved through formal channels of cooperation between public authorities um, and always only um, dealing with the necessary personal data. What does it mean? It means we are there to protect companies, for example, from undue access requests. We're there to protect citizens and make sure that their rights are safeguarded. And one way, or the best way to do that is to have public authorities working together. 
obviously, for companies who are faced with conflicting um, data protection legislation, it will also help to apply rigorously the data minimization principle so that there is less to share with in the first place, to apply data security measures, to have a trusted data protection officer or in-house so you have uh, steady and ready advice at hand, and day-to-day -day contacts with your local data protection supervisory authority. All of these measures will eventually help to uh, resolve conflicts or at least make them less painful. And I'll leave it at this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, and, and for uh, relating the, the themes of this panel to the uh, proposed data protection reform. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Hosuk and ask you for your contribution, which we're very interested in, given your experience in, here in Europe, in the international organizations, and in Asia, too. So you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you um, to the previous speakers for your excellent contributions and also to the organizers. And uh, I have a slightly different take on this subject. Uh, I suspect that many of you come from the field of law or technology. I'm also a lawyer, a very bad one, second-rate one, and uh, if I believe a former commissioner, um, but I'm also a third-rate economist. And so when you talk about protection, I tend to also think in same terms, in terms of legal protection and protection of our rights, uh, which I believe is fundamental. Um, but also I think about protectionism in the field of economics, i.e. Uh, national policies by governments to protect their industries, which very often harm their own economies and harm the international trading system. Now, international trading system is, well, fundamental to the world we live in and the, the growth and the jobs we create, but it's also very important to, to me. Um, partly because I, in my former career, uh, I used to be a government official. Uh, I'm, believe it or not, I'm Swedish, and I used to be a part of the Swedish trade negotiation team, and uh, which negotiates many of the trade agreements in cooperation with the European Commission. And it does not make me an incarnation of Satan, I just want to say that. Uh, but it that makes me understand the value of how global cooperation in the economic field, what it contributes to our economy. And in that sense, one of the biggest things that actually happened in the international trading system is the internet and the cross-border data flows. And sometimes I describe it uh, very often to ministers, which reminds me very much of Hacker, actually, and I might have been a reincarnation of uh, Bernard when I think about it, a very lowly civil servant. But if I would look at the internet, and uh, if uh, I see a $1.5 trillion economy, that's what the online commerce is worth, and it grows 20% per year. If I, put, if I make a comparison to a country, it's actually the same size of Canada, Australia, and it grows three times fast as China. If, this, if the internet and the digital economy was a country, we would negotiate a free trade agreement with it. If it refused, we would invade it. <laughs> anyway, and even in a country like France, which by some is not seen as the pioneer or trailblazer of anything internet, uh, online commerce is actually worth about 3% of its GDP, and that's actually bigger than the car industry. And, uh, and we know how much French love their cars. And uh, considering this, I mean, it seems like it's a huge amount of commerce that actually has moved to the internet. And, but that's not actually the end of the story. The thing is that the cross-border data flows and the digital economy has penetrated into traditional manufacturing and traditional services that typically accounts for about 95% of our jobs. And what I'm talking about is the supply chains of transport, shops, insurers, banking, well, basically anything you do in the daily life involves cross-border data flows in one form or another. And when I look at actually the inputs, what raw materials that goes into different industry. I see that actually in most fields it's more important than energy. 
it's about 3% of the transport sector. Uh, it's, we are talking actually data and data processing accounts for 3% of the cost in, in the transport sector, whereas it only uses 1.7% in energy. In manufacturing, I, I'm talking about manufacturing of screws and bolts and medical devices and pharmaceuticals and what have you. We are talking about 2.4% versus 1.9, etc., etc. It's actually an astounding number. And in the services economy, which accounts for 80% of our employment, we are talking about up to 30%. It's actually by far the biggest input. This, when, when business lobbyists from the ICT sector talk about this is the lifeblood of the economy, I hate to admit it, but they are right. Yeah. And it actually shows, I mean, believe it or not, as I said, I'm a European. I'm very proud to be European. But we can see this already in our macro statistics in terms of our competitiveness. We know that we are losing in terms of our productivity, i.e. how much, if I work one hour, how much is that hour worth in terms of, not in terms of salaries, but what, what is the actually economic value that I managed to create in one hour? It's actually 10% less than my American counterpart. Now, I hate even more to admit that American trade negotiators are better than I am, but in short, if you look at it across the sector, manufacturing, healthcare, what have you, basically an American worker is 10% more effective than a European one. And these 10% is 100% attributed to the fact that they have adapted to the ICT technologies better. What does this mean? We are losing out in the world market. Exports account for much, much more of the European economy than the United States. Uh, if you look at France, we are talking about 30% of the GDP coming from export. The United States is actually just around 10%. So we are losing out more and more of the world market. And this worries me and this keeps me up at night. And in the trading field, these rights, we like to see them as, let's say, not contrary to the fact the right to trade and to facilitate business and the ability to export as well as import. But every barrier that we build, intentionally or unintentionally, represents a cost that further uh, have a further detrimental effect on our competitiveness, productivity, and in the end, our exports. And when I See, for example, the legislation that we have in Europe, the GDPR, that has been pr uh, proposed. And uh, there have been many cost estimates that has been done by very good economists uh, in terms of what it will cost in terms of uh, public finances, how much does it actually cost to introduce a DPO. We haven't actually looked into the fact what will happen with cross-border data flows when it actually becomes much more expensive to move data across borders. Our natural instinct would tell us, hmm, this will give us more data processing job into Europe. But the fact is that when you start to introduce trade barriers to your economy, whether they are legitimate or not, they represent a real cost. You start to shred jobs. So, in fact, depending on how severe the legislation is, we are looking at a GDP loss of about 0.4% to 1.1%. In the worst case scenario, we're talking about full data localization in Europe and no data moves out. And the interesting fact in this is that actually the ones who win are the United States because our main competitors are actually in the United States. If we introduce a sanction or a tax on productivity, our number one competitor will gain. So they will export more, they take bigger share, of the Chinese market, Japanese market, Australian market, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, what will happen is that we will create a few hundred data processing jobs in Eastern Europe, and the German manufacturing superiority will basically die. And of course, is that a concern? Yes. And this is something, I mean, I've heard in a pri previous speakers about uh, the uh, market of civil the internet in Brazil. And I, I, I fully acknowledge the fact that there is, an, of course, a legal question as well as technical question you mentioned, but there is also an economic one. Their business lobbies went in and said, actually, we can't afford this. This won't be able to 
we can't uh, simply implement this, not only on technical grounds, but also the fact that the business environment in Brazil is difficult enough. We need to start firing people. And that's where the danger starts. And so, now I'm going to talk about what free trade agreement uh, plays a role in this. And they are basically designed to facilitate business and also consumers so that the to keep the prices low, uh, to the furthest extent possible, preserve the legal character and the protection of each economy. And this is the reason why, for example, when we do free trade agreements with developing countries, we try to export the legislation to the furthest possible extent or international standards. The problem is now that we are now starting to negotiate with developed countries, for example, like United States, Japan, and uh, Canada, and uh, I believe that many more countries are on their way. And where you have different type of legislations which, had, which are not equivalent to our legislation, but probably perfectly adequate. And this creates a fundamental problem. I liken this to a Hollywood celebrity marriage. If you have two A-list celebrity who never ever had to adapt to another country or uh, let's say another person's habits. And they need to start sharing a bathroom every morning. You will very quickly have a divorce. This is the reason why if you live in the reality in the trenches of trade negotiations, you know that they are extremely, almost ex unlikely that they happen. And of course, the biggest trade agreements have often failed. And Another factor in this is that we tend to think of Europe, of course, as a vanguard, a leader, and of course we are in, this, we are in the center of the multilateral system. But we are losing our agenda-setting powers, and partly because of the economic crisis, uh, we are, yeah, and of course uh, we are losing our um, relevance uh, in the international system, and this also accounts in the WTO and many international forums. And, uh, and the problem is that even if we decide that we are not going to negotiate, negotiate trade agreements, the rest of the world will do it. And when we look at these numbers and what these major trade agreements like TPP, which involves United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, Peru, and Singapore, and when these great coalitions actually manage to basically facilitate the business environments and working environments and make trade flow easier, we will lose about a half percent of our GDP. And let me just, for non-economists, third-rate economists out there, uh, just let me explain to you what it is. It's basically doubling the euro crisis. All the benefits we would reap from this big monstrous thing called TTIP will disappear overnight. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you believe in preserving your current state of welfare, public finances, and standard living, basically we have to do the same amount of trade agreements as the other guys do. This is the competitive reality that we live in. We can't make them stop facilitating their business environments. We can't stop them from the regulation. So this is basically the economic reality that we live in. And cross-border data flows is actually very much in the center. If you're talking about the new energy of the economy, what people used to go to war for in the 40s and 50s and the 60s, basically we are going to negotiate these agreements and they are going to be in some way a part of it. And not because privacy is bad, but mostly because trade barriers such as online censorship, mandatory license to open up a website, or data localization requirement that are completely unnecessary where there are other measures available. These disproportionate measures are very often blocked, stopped, use whatever terminology you like, but somehow moderated in these trade agreements. And just to be very, very clear, this trade agreement, we have always negotiated cross-border data flows, even in our previous FTAs. 
but to our advantage. When we negotiated FTA with Korea, for example, we demanded that the data of Korean consumers can be shipped back to Europe. Now, Korea has a privacy law, but we didn't want them to process all consumers' data. So it's actually unilaterally written to our advantage, and we used it as an, within quotation mark, weapon against the Koreans. And this is basically to protect our economy and to make sure that free trade rules prevail. And now that we are now negotiating with equal size partners like United States and Japan, and where basically the agenda has turned against us and the rest of the world is actually leading this development, I, I really can't see any development except that we are going to follow into a more free trade agenda. And I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing. Of course not. I have to admit I'm a free trader. I believe in the open economy. And uh, in terms of setting global standards, these will be a much better instrument than anything we have out there to make sure that we have reasonable protection standards and that we cut away disproportionate and actually intentionally protectionist measures that actually exist out in the world because they are designed practically to steal European jobs. Anyway, there are many things I can say in terms of how free trade agreements try to harmonize different systems and rules. Yeah, but uh, in the end, it's not a question about consumers. Now, I, I'd like to point out the fact that we are talking about conflict of jurisdiction, and these are what needs to be solved, and these are what the barriers are. And with that, thank you very much. Well, I, I like uh, always very much at conferences very interesting, provocative, well-reasoned, uh, and also entertaining presentations. And you've, you've given us that, and also, indeed, on a point that was not, not touched on by the other panelists. So I think it, this, this rounds up our presentations very well. Uh, we have now exactly uh, 10 minutes. My, all of the panelists have been not only very interesting in their presentations, but very disciplined, uh, for which I'm grateful. So we have a, a chance to get uh, questions from you and to have a bit of discussion with the panelists. I would just ask those of you who want to ask questions two things. Number one, please raise your hand and identify yourself uh, before you ask a question. And number two, please ask a question and don't th give, uh, give a long, long speech because uh, we, we want to give uh, uh, time for, for others to ask questions. So I'll take maybe two or three uh, at a time. Anyone have any questions for our panelists? All right, back there, and anyone else? And someone way in the back, too, so please. Yes, uh, Gloria Gonzalez Fuster from the VUB here in Brussels. My question is for Mr. Cerdic. Uh, you mentioned the negotiations of the umbrella agreement. Could you give just more information about the status of these negotiations, especially in light of this apocalyptic uh, perspective on the difficulties to have agreements? How is this uh, agreement evolving? Uh, Maybe one more question, and then we'll answer them together. Uh, someone in the back yeah. had their hand up. Stuart Dresner from Stuart, Privacy yes. Laws and Business. In fact, my question to Thomas, also to Thomas Erdick, also about free trade, to what extent the European Commission is, is actively engaging in the free trade agreement, and because I thought the idea was that privacy would not be part of the uh, transatlantic uh, trade negotiations, so perhaps a bit of a clarification on that would be helpful. Well, I think it's, you're on the spot now, Thomas. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, umbrella, yes, it's, we are negotiating, it's, um, it, but it's very simple. The ball is now in the um, court of the United States. We were seeking the possibility for uh, EU individuals to have judicial, judicial redress possibilities, and that is something which the US needs to deliver uh, via legislation. Um, if they deliver, great. Well, if they don't deliver, nothing's going to work. So we're waiting for the US to move forward. On the free trade, um, yes, the European Commission is, of course, engaged in the free trade negotiations and the TTIP, but it is very clear data protection, privacy protection is not part of that. It is uh, not a barrier to trade. It's completely outside. We, we are not discussing that at all, to clarify. 
Okay, clear, clear answers to clear questions. There's one, uh, one question here. Uh, my name is Magda Pich. I represent Polish Employers Organization and I have a question to uh, Mr. Bennett and uh, Mr. Makiyama. Like from a legal point of view and also economic point of view, what solution and approach could you suggest not to lose this competitiveness uh, that, uh, that was raised? Thank you. All right, one more question. Yes. Professor Miyashita. Thank you. My name is Hiroshi Miyas, the law professor at Chuo University, Tokyo. I have a question to Thomas, probably Professor Karin Bennett as well. Uh, what, is, what, what is the impression about the interoperability between the CBPR and BCR? Article 29 opinion delivered that there is uh, incompatibility, incompatibility between these two mechanisms. What is the impression? Okay, two questions. I'll let you, who wants to start? Uh, sure, sure. Um, um, uh, on, on the issue of uh, competitiveness and the relationship between privacy rules and competitiveness and protectionism, I, I mean, I, I, I listened very carefully to what was being said here. I, I, I am not convinced, um, and I think that 50 years of experience in privacy and data protection suggests that although these, are, these issues are, are raised in transnational trade negotiations, they tend to be somewhat... Um, peripheral and the privacy law, privacy rules, um, you know, are uh, not the main reason why businesses locate, not the main reason why, why there might be uh, um, damages to, to a, a, a nation's or a, a, a region's competitive. Um, on the issue of CBR and CPPR, I mean, I've read the Article 29 thing. I, I think I'll leave that to, to others to, to address. I, I just... Briefly, though, I wanted to just clarify something that, that Thomas said and just wanted to clarify my point about the role of data subjects in all of this. Um, I'm, I'm not arguing that data subjects have not been important and participated actively in all kinds of domestic processes. Uh, my point is this, that if you look over 40 years of debate about international data flows and international data, personal data regulation, um, I think the conclusion is that it is, in fact, extraordinarily difficult for individuals to assert their rights against organizations that reside elsewhere. It might be different. And, and the, you know, Max Schrems is a, is a great case here, and I was going to mention him, but I, I actually think it is the, 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 the case that sort of proves the rule, the exception that proves the rule. And there, of course, you've, you've not just got individuals, but you've actually got a sort of a, a, a civil society group uh, that brings people together in order to assert their rights. So I, I do take your point, but, but I was trying to say something rather different. And, and, um, and, I, and I think that, that um, uh, I'm, I'm still extremely worried that in all of the debates that we're having about international data protection, that that particular problem, that particular reality is not being um, uh, uh, confronted squarely. Uh, when we begin to talk about the relationship between data protection and larger trade and economic realities. Yes, I want to answer on the um, incompatibility of the BCRs and the uh, CBPRs. Well, first of all, um, I think what is more important to stress, there are commonalities, um, a great number of them, but there are indeed differences, important differences between the two um, frameworks. So, um, did we give guidance, uh, the Article 29 Working Party is giving guidance to those companies who are trying to um, certify both, because double certification is possible, but at this stage, at the moment, um, there they are the important differences. So um, it's, it's a good approach to, to look at the commonalities, but as long as these differences are not ironed out, you have to look at both frameworks at the moment. But then again, that is a process which is being made easier by the guidance from the 29 and by the Commission. So in the future, I hope that will lead to even further commonalities being based on the practice on applying these frameworks. Okay, thank you. Is, is there any field, I wonder, with more confusing acronyms than data protection? We have CP, BCPRs, BCRs, et cetera. But anyway, um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, before lunch calls us. 
way in the back. All right. Thank you, Christos Velasco from Protección Datos Mexico. I have a question with regards to the cross-border data, data flows, which is provided in the EU regulation. Is, I would like to know whether the focus of the EU Commission would be more on the use of binding corporate rules, standard contractual clauses, rather than providing the adequacy decision to third countries like they did with Uruguay and Argentina. That's something that I would like to hear, I mean, not only from the representative of the European Commission, but from all other speakers. Thank you. So all of you, what, what do you think should be the preferred approach, or do you have any preference? <clears throat> let, let me start with answering that. Um, the, the EU regulation offers a bouquet of possibilities. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all model, but there are many avenues to achieving um, adequate protection or having appropriate safeguards in place and whatever fits best to a given situation can or cannot be used. For companies, BCRs are probably the best way. Third countries with a robust and effective legal framework in place, the route by adequacy might be the best to, to vigorously pursue um, because that would immediately benefit the whole country. Um, there are other um, ways individual supervisory authorities can give authorizations for individual transfers. You have exemptions, possibilities. So, as I said, it's a toolbox of facilitating data flows. No preferred option there. Any other comments on that point from uh, any yeah, of the panelists? Just, Colin? just briefly, I, I, I'd like to say something about the position of Canada in this larger debate because Canada tends to sort of get left out and so just 30 seconds if you forgive me. <laughs> um, we are adequate and we continue to be adequate, yes. Correct? Yes, yes, okay. We're Canada's... Your private sector, okay, right. Um, so that's good, I think, in the sense that adequate, being adequate is better than being inadequate. Although I have to say I'm not entirely sure over the period when we've been adequate what effect that's had on our economy or on our data subjects. Um, the Canadian government has actually announced that it is going to join the APEX CPBR system. And I am really puzzled by that decision. I don't understand why. Um, because any Canadian company that's exporting data out of Canada has to comply with PIPEDA and uh, the organization to organization accountability rules in PIPEDA. So I'm, I'm very puzzled as to why, why that, is, that is occurring. But I think it's an example of where these two systems sort of clash and um, where governments are making, having to make these sort of tricky decisions about, you know, which sets of rules to apply in their own, own individual economies. So it'd be interesting to see how these decisions <clears throat> are made in the Cana by the Canadian government over the next year, year or so, and uh, indeed what Canadian corporations, uh, if, a tw if any, sign up to the CPBR system. Thank you. Well, to, to, to close this conference, uh, or to, to, to close this panel, maybe just, to, just a short comment uh, relating to what I think you two are saying. We, we've been talking uh, really mainly about commercial data or data transferred between individuals and companies. We, we often forget that there are a lot more aspects to transborder data flows. For example, governments transfer a huge amount of personal data between themselves, and I'm not talking about the ne necessarily just law enforcement, but for all sorts of routine purposes, mundane purposes, how are we going to cover those transfers? We have uh, transfers to international humanitarian organizations that need to provide essential services to people in desperate situations. Uh, so th there, are, there are many, many unanswered questions here. In some ways, I think the commercial sector should be the easiest uh, want to find a solution to, but the fact that we're very far from such a solution shows the complexity of the topic. I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Uh, we, we hear the, the lunch is being prepared next door to us, so I'll let you all go to that, and thank you very much for your attention.